People ask me all the time why we chose to plant in Denver, and um, I simply tell them why not. Uh, there are so many places in our country that need Jesus, but Denver is one of the most needy places for Jesus. There are three million people living in the Denver metro area and its surrounding suburbs. Two million out of those three million have no religion whatsoever. 94% of those people are out of church. Only 6% go to church. That means nine out of 10 people are actually lost and do not have God on their radar. Denver is a very happy place to live. In fact, there's a, a study that's done recently that says Denver's the happiest place to live in the United States. And it's easy to see why as you walk around this place, it's so beautiful. There's city parks and the Rocky Mountains are at your doorstep. There's outdoor stuff everywhere. 300 plus days of sunshine and it's just a beautiful place and the people are so laid back and they, they're very friendly here. But in the midst of all that, there is a, a dark spiritual undercurrent. There is this need for something more, for something that is, uh, that the, the people are trying to fill this void in their life. As we prayer walked this area, as we drove around this area, God just began to, to grab our hearts and to shake it. And, and the more we drove around Broomfield and Louisville, Lafayette, Superior, even Boulder, our hearts began to just really burst for this area, for these people. Uh, there are very few churches, and those that are here are struggling to survive. And so our heart is to plant near Broomfield and these other surrounding suburbs. We see this amazing potential moving in over the next five to 10 years. The area is gonna actually double in population. A lot of high-tech companies, a lot of medical companies moving in, and we hope to ride that wave of change as we plant this church. We hope to see lives changed, marriages restored, uh, people coming to know Jesus. And that's the, that's the most important thing for us, is that we point people to Jesus. But it's so good to be back in Texas. You guys have it so good here. You have all these live oak trees and, and uh, Tex-Mex and all this oxygen. So it's so good to be back in Texas, um, the greatest nation in the world. So um, really grateful for Pastor Matt and for your church. You guys have been a part of the journey of the Livingstone Church uh, for the past two years. Um, you guys have sent us mission teams. Your youth has come out to work with us stuffing Easter eggs and, and helping us get the word out about some of our events. And so it's, it's a real honor to be here this morning and to worship with you. So I want to tell you a little bit about Denver because I think a lot of times we think of Denver as being the place that we pass through to go skiing or to go camping or whatever else you're doing in Colorado that uh, that, that you're not going to bring back here and tell others about. But um, Denver, Denver is the fourth largest city of people who have no religion. Two-thirds of the population claim to have no religion whatsoever. That's, that means that two-thirds of the population claim no religion. That's no Hinduism, no Muslim, no Christian, nothing. They're nuns. They're the fourth largest in the nation. There are more marijuana dispensaries in Denver than there are Starbucks, 7-Elevens, and McDonald's combined. Potluck lunches are something totally different at our church. <laughs> you should see our green room. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Colorado ranks seventh in the nation for suicides. It's a very dark place, spiritually. 93% of the population in Broomfield, where we planted the Livingstone Church, 93% of the population does not have a relationship with Jesus. 93%. If you take the Mountain Pacific time zones and make it its own country, it would be the fourth largest lost country in the world. If you go to any major city in the western United States, that's the Mountain and Pacific time zones, anywhere from 5 to 10% of the population are believers. That's it. It's an incredible mission field. The Western U.S. has never seen a movement like we have here in the South, in the Bible Belt. We've never experienced that in the Western U.S. Our desire as the Livingstone Church is to plant 10 churches in the next 10 years because we believe God is calling churches like you and churches like us to plant more churches. That's the only way we're going to see that percentage of lostness decrease. Already we've planted one church. We've helped launch and plant one church in Boulder, which is just about 15 minutes away from us. And we're in conversation with the Colorado Baptist General Convention about a church that's 
needing to be replanted in Estes Park. And so we're praying through some, some different things, but we have a heart for the Western U.S. We want to see the Western U.S. reached with the gospel. Currently, we're the only Southern Baptist church in Broomfield. First Baptist Church, Broomfield, closed its doors just a few years ago, and so since then we are the only Southern Baptist Church. There's not a lot of churches anyway, and there's more than 100,000 people that live within a three-mile radius of our church. Broomfield is expected to double in the next five to ten years. There's a big need for more churches. Since we launched the Livingstone Church, 141 people have prayed to receive Christ. That's a little over two and a half years. Now, the Lord's so good to us. And it's because of faithful people like you that are serving alongside us that we've seen the fruit that we've seen. We've had 19 kids accept Christ last week at VBS, and so that makes 160 people that have prayed to receive Christ in the past two and a half years. At a VBS last week, we had 153 kids uh, register. It's an, it's an incredible thing. Most people don't know what a VBS is in Denver, so we have to call it a kids' camp. And so uh, the, the parents just love it because they get four date nights in a row. And I'm so sick and tired of in the wild theme. I can't tell you how much I want to get that out of my mind. <laughs> On Easter Sunday, we had more than 350 people in attendance. That was our largest attendance to date. Most of those people have no church background at all. They may have attended with their grandparents as a kid, or they may have grown up in a Catholic church as a kid, but most of them have zero church background. We had 20 salvations and five baptisms at Easter. It's just beautiful. I love seeing God work. And I'm not going to lie, it's been a long and challenging process of planting, getting this church rolling and off the ground, but I want to take you all the way back to the beginning. I was doing college ministry out in, um, out in Lubbock. Um, you don't have to applaud. Um, I, I went to Oklahoma State, so it's a challenge for me to want to applaud for any other Texas team. Uh, but uh, I was doing college ministry there in Lubbock at a church, Indiana Avenue Baptist Church, and uh, we had our, our college ministry meet at our North Campus. Um, on Sunday mornings, and we started with about 40 students, and over the next couple of years, we experienced tremendous growth, and we saw, uh, we topped out around 500 students in our, in our, at our peak, and so uh, it was just an incredible season of ministry and seeing God move and grow and, and do all these things, but uh, this mother, this mother reaches out to me from Phoenix. Her name's Carrie. Now, I always get calls from moms and dads wanting, to, wanting me to call their kids and invite them to church, as if that's really going to work, you know? No kid in their right mind is going to be thrilled that their parent called the pastor and have the pastor call them. So anyway, Carrie calls me and she goes, Keith, I know that you have uh, a shuttle that picks students up from tech and brings them uh, to your church. Would you call my two boys and invite them to church? They haven't been to church since they moved into the dorms. And I said, absolutely. I called the two boys. They wanted nothing to do with me or church. And they said, pretty much, thanks, but no thanks. And so I just kind of left it there. Every time the mom would call me, she called me several times a semester, I would call the boys and I would say, hey, it's me again. I uh, just want to invite you to this next thing that we're doing, and I uh, would love to see you there. And so uh, that was back in 2013, 2014. Around August 2014, my wife and I began to feel a stirring in our hearts to go plant a church somewhere with few churches. And we felt like God was calling us out of the Bible Belt, uh, maybe somewhere like Austin, Texas, uh, you know, where there's, you, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I see an applause right there. Uh, but seriously, we began praying that God would uh, show us, God, are you calling us to plant a church? If you're calling us to plant a church, then you got to show us how. Because to quit my job, to walk away from a full-time paycheck, and then raise maybe a quarter of a million or maybe 300000 that looks ridiculously impossible. And we began praying. My wife and I began praying morning, evening, for about two months. And we didn't hear a thing. Heard nothing from God. In August 2014, this woman in Phoenix, Carrie, she had 
surgery, so she stayed at home, and her husband took the two boys bound for Lubbock, pick up, load it up. As they're driving down I-10, they had a blowout near Wilcox, Arizona. They flipped the vehicle. All three men rejected and died at the scene. In one moment, this woman lost everything. And of course, when we found out about that, we reached out to her. We prayed with her weekly. We, we said, Carrie, if there's anything you need, you let us know. You know, we'll do our best to love you from Lubbock. And, you know, if you need anything, you just call us. We'll, we'll find someone there in Phoenix, or we'll get on a plane, and we'll come do it ourselves. You're family to us now. And we began a relationship with this woman, and, and we didn't really share anything that was on our hearts as far as planting a church, but... But we prayed for her a lot over the phone and never even, never, we really didn't even know her. We didn't meet her in person until many, many months later. One morning, two months into our prayer time, my wife and I, asking God to show us how financially this is even possible, Carrie calls me one morning. She goes, Keith, I couldn't sleep last night. God wants me to give you some money for your ministry. And I don't know why, but, but I just wanted to tell you that. And I told her where she could put all this, you know, all the, all the different ways that she could put that money towards our college ministry. And she said, well, pray about it because it's $25,000. I was blown away. This was a tenth. This was a tithe. This was a tenth of what we thought we would need to start this church. I said, Carrie, let me pray over it for two more days because i got to make sure before I take this jump off this cliff that God's in this. And she had no idea what we were praying about, but I called her back two days later. I said, Carrie, looks like we're, uh, we, we've been asking God to plant a church, and, and uh, we've been asking God to show us how financially, and we believe this is how. I said, we would be so honored if you put that money towards our church plant. She said, absolutely. I said, Carrie, we don't even know where we're going to plant this thing. She said, doesn't matter. I know God wants you to have it. So then I looked at my wife, and I said, we got to do this. <laughs> She's like, I know. So we said, okay, I guess we're all in. We're going to set sail for a distant shore. We're going to burn the ships. We're going to pack all our stuff in coffins because we're going there to die. We're never coming back to the great nation of Texas. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we began praying about where God was leading us, and we really did pray through Austin. Um, we felt like maybe God wanted us uh, to stay in Texas, but that was a closed door very quickly. We went to Seattle, Washington. We really felt like, man, that's, that's, that's our heart. That's where our heart is. We've, we've loved Seattle. We love the space. We love the people. We love everything. And then, uh, you know, that, that door closed very quickly. And then um, we, we actually uh, flew up to Denver, Colorado shortly after and prayed through that city. And I got to tell you, we were miserable praying through every single city, every single suburb, until we came to Broomfield of all places. And I can't explain it, but Broomfield is where the ground shook for us. And this is where we felt God give us that peace that we were looking for. It was that peace that the Scripture talks about that flows like a river. You know what I'm talking about? That, that peace that, that surpasses all understanding. This is what we were feeling. And so I reached out to Carrie. Uh, a few weeks later, and I said, Carrie, looks like we're going to be moving to Denver, Colorado. NAM has assessed us. They've approved us. They've greenlighted us. We're going to Denver. It's a little place called Broomfield, Colorado. You probably never even heard of it. She goes, you got to be kidding me. She said, Broomfield? Broomfield is where I was born and raised. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm just done. I get it, God. You're calling us to Broomfield. And we launched the church on the second anniversary of her family's death just two miles east of her childhood home. God has been so good to us. It's been a challenge. It's been a journey. But this morning I want to talk to you about your faith. And when I talk about your faith, I'm not talking about the faith that we claim as Christians. I'm talking about stepping out in faith and living in faith. Because I'll be honest, I used to sit in chairs like this listening to church planners like me and go, well, that's for you. No, but this is for you too. You see, being a Christian and being around Christianity are two different things. Henry Blackaby said, we're so activity-oriented that we think that we're saved for a task to perform rather than a relationship to enjoy. And the reason I like this quote from Henry Blackaby is because it, it reminds me of growing up in the Bible Belt. 
That the more that I did for God, the more that I was involved in church, the more that I served and the more that I gave, the more that I whatever, the closer I felt to God or the closer maybe I felt like I was doing something for God. And you see, our faith is not just something that we have to uh, do good works. Yes, we're saved to do good works for sure, but, but I, love this, I love this quote because he says we're, we're, we're actually saved for this relationship. And I don't know about you, but I try so hard growing up to uh, meet this, this standard, right? I've, I've tried so hard to measure up to this standard that I set for myself as a follower of Jesus. And sometimes I get so heavily uh, focused on the task at hand that I forget that this is actually a relationship with an almighty God that we call Father. He's relational. All my life, all my ministry career, ministry has been hard, it's been heavy, and it's been difficult. And this is the exact opposite of what Jesus tells us, right? I mean, he tells us in Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. My burden is easy, my yoke is light. Ministry for me has never been, until recently, restful, easy, and light. It's been difficult, burdensome, and hard. But I think that's because I have this mindset of my faith. You see, Christianity isn't me living for Jesus. We say that a lot in the Bible Belt. We say Christianity is me living for Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. But Christianity is not me living for Jesus. Christianity is Jesus living his life in and through me. And when you understand that paradigm shift, your life will radically change as a follower of Jesus. Christianity is Jesus living his life in and through me. Major Ian Thomas says this, the Christian life is nothing less than the life he lived then, lived now by him in you. Let me say that again. The Christian life is nothing less than the life he lived then, Jesus lived then, lived now by faith, by him in you. You see, my, the primary call in my life isn't doing ministry for Jesus or doing tasks for Jesus. It's intimacy with Jesus. And I know we know that as Christians because we sit in these pews or these chairs every week, week in and week out, we hear these things. But I mean, I'm talking about life. I'm talking about outside of Sunday mornings. Are we really experiencing that intimacy with Jesus? You know, people are leading in different capacities. You know, I used to think pastors and missionaries and church staff, that was their desire, that was their job to accomplish the mission of God, but nothing could be further from the truth. Every doctor, School teacher, construction worker, principal, lawyer, nurse, we've all been brought to Jesus relationally so that through our lives we might bring glory to Him. And once we understand that, once we start living in faith and stepping out in faith and following Jesus, we will understand so much more about this life that Jesus says is abundant, this life that is life giving not draining. You see, my entire life I've been thinking about commitment. You know, that's something we say in church a lot. Commit yourself to coming to church. Commit, make, make a commitment to the Lord. Make a commitment to coming to church. And while those are great intentions, and, and, and while the word commit yourselves to the Lord is found in the Bible, commitment is not found in the Bible, but the word die is. Die to yourself. Die to your selfish desires. Die to the old you. You see, when Jesus saved you, when, when he died on the cross for your sins, he raised you from spiritual death to spiritual life. Now, when someone comes from, back from the dead, back to life, there's a big change. And there should be a big change in us. You know, think about that for a moment. What does it look like for us to live in faith, to walk in faith, to have a resurrected mindset? We've got to die to ourselves first. 
Many people today in the American church call themselves Christians because they believe the Christian life is only about admiring Jesus' example. Not realizing the call is actually to live it out. Not to just admire what Jesus did, but to become more like him. If you read only Jesus' words, if you read just the red words in the Bible, you will see that Jesus standard for following him is is far different than our mindset sometimes as followers of Jesus in the in the Bible belt and I just think and just in the American church altogether Galatians 2 says this listen to this Paul says I've been crucified with Christ I know we read this I know we probably become callous to hearing this but think about what Paul's saying Erase everything you've ever heard about this passage or ever thought about this passage and read it with fresh eyes this morning. I've been crucified with Christ. Crucifixion is not something that's pretty. It's not something that's sterile. It's dirty. It's it's painful. It's disgusting. It's humiliating. And Paul says, I want that over a good life, over an easy life. I want that over anything else, to be crucified with Jesus. What Paul is really saying is, I want to be more like him. I want to understand what it means to suffer for God. I want to understand what it means to to suffer well like Jesus did. And he says, "I, I, I want to be crucified. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That that old me is dead. It's been crucified. That old me before Jesus is put on the cross. That old me is now a dead man. I am now a new creation raised to life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And check this out. This reaffirms what we've been saying. In the life I now live in the flesh. Get this. I live by faith in the Son of God. Reminds me of what Ian, Major Ian Thomas said. The life I live now In the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the New Testament is very clear. We are not just to believe Jesus in Jesus' crucifixion and his ministry. We are to be crucified with Jesus. He's calling us to something greater. He's calling us to something far greater than we could ever hope or dream of. In Luke chapter 14, that's where we're going to be this morning. 25, verse 25, says, Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If anyone comes to me and wants to follow me, he says, It's going to cost you something. Now, Jesus isn't saying to hate your family. I mean, this, this is a, an, an exaggerated word here because hate is a sin. He's not telling you to go hate your parents and hate your sisters, even if you do, or hate your brothers. Matthew, eight, or Matthew chapter 10 says, anyone who loves the Father, Jesus says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is what he's saying. He's saying if if there's anything else in front of me, if you're you're pouring out your heart, you're giving your life over to anything else other than me, then I don't know what to do with you. Whoever doesn't put me first, whoever doesn't find priority in following me first, I have no use for you. I don't really know what to do with you. Even if you love your own life, more than following Jesus, he says, you can't be my disciple. Maybe this is why Jesus had such few disciples. He, he laid it out very clearly. And I think we read this through the context of the American church and our mindset as Westerners, and sometimes we just think, well, that's, that's them. That's not necessarily us. I mean, no, this is you and me. You see, a disciple is a Christian, and a Christian is a disciple. A follower of Jesus is a Christian and a disciple. It's all synonymous. It's not different things. This is the same thing. In other words, Jesus says, if you don't give everything to me, you can't follow me. You can't be my disciple. In verse 27, he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, you can't be my disciple. Because 
I might walk out these doors and there may be a pile of crosses. I may have to go all the way to Golgotha to die on the cross. Are you in, Jesus says. I may call you to go serve on a mission trip, short-term mission trip. Are you all in? I may spur a desire in you to go share your faith with your next-door neighbor. Are you in? Because if you're not, I don't know what to do with you. You see, this is about us, the church, the people, not a building, but a people that are, that are called out from the rest of the world to become more like Jesus, to give selflessly, to serve like Jesus did, to forgive and love like Jesus did. This is why you were saved. I hope you get this. Verse 28 He says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is still a long way off, he sends a, a delegation and asks for terms of peace. You see, what, what Jesus is saying is, you got to count the cost. If you're all in, if you're, if you're truly ready to follow me, he says, it's going to cost you something. And it may cost you everything. And maybe it should. Maybe it should cost us everything because Jesus gave everything for you. He gave everything for me. And he says, so... Before you decide to follow me, before you say I'm all in, count the cost. What if it costs you something? What if it costs you your pride? What if it costs you your money? What if it costs you your time? What if it costs you things? And I love how Jesus talks about this building. He says, who building a great tower doesn't sit down and estimate if he's going to be able to afford to complete it? In other words, don't start this thing with me and then leave me halfway through this job. And then he mentions this war. He says, he says if a king is going to battle, who, who, what king, what king in his right mind would, would not see if it's going to cost him his entire army before he goes to battle? And I love this because what we're doing is more than just physical. This is a spiritual thing. This, there's spiritual warfare going on even, even now. And I love how Jesus makes that connection. May cost you something. May cost you your life. In verse 33, he says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, he can't be my disciple. What if you just read those words for the first time? Looking at your life now, would you really go back and say, yeah, I'm all in, Jesus. I want to follow you wherever you go. Uh, because remember, there have been people that have come to Jesus. We see this a couple of chapters earlier in Luke. There's a man that comes up to Jesus, and he sees all the great things that he's doing. He sees all the crowds that are following him. He says, I want a part of that. I want to follow you. And Jesus says, dude, I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The birds, the foxes, they have places to lay. I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. Are you sure you want to follow me? Because it's not always glorious. It's not always easy. It's not always... Are you sure? Are you all in? He says salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, its taste, how can it be made salty again? How can the saltiness be restored? You see, you and I, Scripture says that we are the salt of the earth. We are the season that brings preservation to those who are perishing. You see, Jesus saved you for a purpose. And it took me years in ministry to understand this. But but God saved you for a purpose. He didn't save you so that you could go about your life and do the things that you want to do. No, when Jesus, when, when he bought you, When he purchased you, he purchased you with his life. Now you belong to him. And everything you have belongs to him. That means your money, your house, your cars, your time. 
even your children, they belong to him. And I think when we start to let go and we start to say, God, you use me in the ways that you see fit. God, I don't want to hold on to the things that I have. Why would I hold on to stuff if I can't take it with me anyway? This life is so short. This life is so quickly fading, and I don't want to hold on to that which is going to stay here. I think what Jesus is really saying is you got to keep your eye on the prize. You've got to keep your eye on the eternal things. If you keep your eye on the eternal things, then none of this other stuff really matters anyway. So what does it mean to die to yourself? What does it mean to become more like Jesus? I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I've been crucified with Christ. This morning, I don't know where you are in your faith walk, or even if you have one, but today I know God is calling you to something. He's calling you to do something. First and foremost, He's calling you to intimacy with Him. I want to challenge you this week to spend 1% of your day, that's 15 minutes, 15 minutes a day in the Word. Spend 15 minutes in the Word, praying to God, listening to Him, praying for Him to move in your life and through you. And this morning, I want to ask you, if you're here this morning, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, if you have no relationship with Him, today could be the day that you get to know God, that you have a relationship with Him. He loves you. He loves you enough not only to die on the cross himself. No, he gave his only son for you. Now, it's one thing for me to give my least favorite child up. No, I'm kidding. But it's quite another thing to give up your only son. That great love that God has for you and for me. That's the kind of relationship that he has with us. Today. If you're ready to give yourself, to surrender yourself to Jesus, you can pray a simple prayer like this. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we do this every Sunday at the Livingstone Church. We don't, wanna, we don't want someone to slip through the cracks. Father, I pray this morning that you would give us the desire of your heart, that you would see in us something to be groomed and grown up in. And Father, today, for those that are here this morning that may have never put their faith in you, God, I pray that they would pray this prayer with me. That they would trust you, surrender to you, their lives. If you're here this morning, you want this relationship with God, pray something like this. Dear God, I know that I've done things that dishonor you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done things that have brought shame. God, I know that you love me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that you raised him to life on the third, third day. God, I thank you that you saved me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us online today and worshiping with us at Mission City Church. We hope that's been a blessing to you. If maybe today you pray to receive Christ or you have spiritual questions, uh, we would love for you to check us out on our website, missioncity.church. And there's a tab there. You can email us, connect at missioncity.church. And we would love to communicate with you, talk to you about the spiritual decision maybe you made today. You also can go to our website and you can find other teachings. You can see our worship ministry. You can see ways that you can connect uh, to our church on an ongoing basis. You can also support the ministry through your financial giving on our website as well. And we invite you to do that. And if you're in San Antonio, hey, just come live. We have two locations that we would love to meet you in person at. I pray that you have a great week. Hopefully you'll come back next week and maybe check us out again. But just know that we're praying for you and thankful for you today.